Hey, good morning. How's it going? We're starting a new book today, so if anyone's new, it's a good day to start with us. I was trying to make a cup decision. That's why I was looking like I was confused. It's because I was. I was confused. I am confused. I saw my package will be here the night before my birthday. Thank you. So oh, no problem. Wait, why is it taking so long to get to you? It should be there. Isn't your birthday Friday? Why is it taking so long to get to you? Oh, that's weird. Yes, we'll be here Thursday. Thursday? That's awfully long. Wow. That's very strange. It shouldn't take that long. I really need to go to the store for milk today. Last time it was six days. That's what I'm saying about my order this weekend. Why? Why? I'm very confused, Haley, why yours are taking so long. Is there something like weird? Do you live in a rear, really rural area? Because I'm not gonna lie to you. I mailed something to two people on Friday last week and they got it on Monday. So that means it was only in the mail Saturday. Like if they, if it got mailed on Friday afternoon and they got it on Monday, morning like Monday morning like not even Monday late so why is it taking six days to get to you in Colorado when it get all the way to that's so weird I literally mailed a package to Ohio and a package to New York on Friday and they both arrived on Monday sometimes they claim weather delays for Colorado that is so weird you guys That's really, really odd. Yeah, Becca, it didn't... I'm super confused. Super confused. Did I put the powder in here instead of in there like a dummy? I did. Cool. Good job, Sash. I'm just happy enough to get it. I know, I know. I'm just saying, like, it would be nice if, uh, you know... Well, Colorado's been hit hard this winter. I guess that's true. Amanda, I'm gonna mail yours today. Um, anyone who got the roll for slimes probably knows they, they have to sit overnight before I can package them, obviously, because, you know, mine took over a week the last restock. It was weird. That is weird. That's so weird. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I don't... I don't understand that at all, to be honest, because some go so fast. Like, what's the difference? I'm mailing them all together. You know what I mean? Priority mail is usually two to three days from Sasha. If not priority, it can take a while. Yeah, that's true, but I know I mailed Haley's priority. I know I did. That's why it shouldn't take that long because it's her birthday stuff, and so I mailed it priority on purpose, and yet it's still not gonna, you know? I mean, I'm still glad that it's it's uh, coming before her birthday, but I know I mailed it priority. I get my stuff the next day because my version of Sasha is basically Amazon. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I don't know. It's just funny. The cup is cute. Watch. Look Look at what happens when you drink out of this cup. The little tongue. I love her little tongue. I think it's adorable. Mine from Sunday will be here Thursday. That mailed out yesterday. So you and Haley are both getting them on Thursday. That's super weird. I wonder why. Because if I mailed them on Monday, 
I guess that is three days. Does anyone have a favorite metal straw for tumblers? Um, I don't have a favorite one, but I've been wanting to try mermaid straws. Have you tried mermaid straws? I haven't tried them yet, but I'm, I'm interested in trying them. Okay, we're gonna go sit down, I'm freezing. I guess it's not that weird. If you mail it on Monday, it is three days until Thursday, I guess. I guess, I don't know. Hold on, I'm just, oh God, I hate that sound. Sorry guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm freezing. Ugh. Good thing I remembered to put the blanket on. I have ones that came with the Kaylin Canteen from forever ago. Um, yeah, I'm gonna make slime tonight. We're gonna do we're gonna do slime tonight. Yep, yep, yep. And look what I have to use as our bookmark today. <laughs> Trying to reorganize my legs here. Okay. Look at that. Renee made this. And I'm gonna use it as a bookmark for this book. Joshua was gone this week so I could join all the lives. Woohoo! Woohoo! Where did he go? Anywhere interesting? I have two doctor's appointments today. I'm not looking forward to them. I wouldn't be either. Oy. I started listening to this book. It's really good. Is it? I'm excited. I'm excited for all of us. Military training off to Washington. Ugh, that sucks. Why can't I be independently wealthy? I've been wondering that about myself. Why can't I be independently wealthy? Uh, okay. Let's get a little bit of light in here, but not too much. So if anyone doesn't know, we are starting The Land of Stories today by Chris Coffer. He's from Glee. I don't know what that means, Malia. Sorry. I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. Okay, so um, if anyone doesn't know, tonight John is going to be on live with me and talking about his book. Maybe uh, we'll do a role for Slime while we're with him. I don't know. Um, depends on if the people who ordered them want them to be done. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe John will roll, maybe John will roll one of the rolls. That would be kind of funny. Um, maybe I'll get John to roll something for us. I don't know, we'll see. But um, he is going to be on live tonight um, with us talking about his book. Um, so you can do mine with him. Maybe, I'll see what he wants to do. He might not be comfortable since he's already nervous to talk about the book. Um, but I will, I will definitely have some written down ready to, to talk to him about and see, I'll ask him. So anyway, we're reading The Land of Stories starting today. Um, it is a kid's book, but you know, it was free. So why not? Like, let's just give it a go. And if we don't like it, we don't have to continue the series. But if we do like it, maybe we read all of them. Who knows, right? All right. This is a pretty cute dedication. When I was still at the park, when I found this book, I opened it up and I read this dedication and I was like, you know what? I think this sounds like a person I'd like to support and read a book from because listen to this. He said, the dedication is to grandma for being my first editor and giving me the best writing advice I've ever received. Christopher, I think you should wait until you're done with elementary school before worrying about being a failed writer. Relatable content. Relatable content. All right. It starts with a quote from C.S. Lewis. Someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. Ooh, oh, that hit hard. Oh, God. <gasps> oh, God. Don't make me cry this early in the morning, Chris. Ooh. Okay, I hear you. Maybe we were meant to find this book. Yeah, wow. 
The book hasn't even started. Jeez, Chris. Trying to like send me into tears at seven in the morning. I forgot my watch. Gosh darn it. Okay. Prologue. The Queen's Visit. The dungeon was a miserable place. Light was scarce and flickered from the torches, bolted to the stone walls. Foul-smelling water dripped inside from the moat circling the palace above. Large rats chased each other across the floor, searching for food. This was no place for a queen. It was just past midnight and all was quiet except for the occasional rustle of a chain. Through the heavy silence of a single footstep echoed through the halls as someone climbed down the spiral steps into the dungeon. A young woman emerged down the steps dressed head to toe in a long emerald coat. She cautiously made her way past the row of cells, sparking the interest of the prisoners inside. With every step she took, her pace became slower and slower and her heart beat faster and faster. The prisoners were arranged according to crime. The deeper she walked into the dungeon, the crueler and more dangerous the criminals became. Her sights were set on a cell at the very end of the hall, where a prisoner of special interest was being watched by a large private guard. The woman had come to ask a question. It was a simple question, but it consumed her thoughts every day, kept her lying awake most nights, and was the only thing she dreamed about with the little sleep she managed. Only one person could give her the answer she needed, and that person was on the other side of the prison bars ahead. I wish to see her, the cloaked woman said to the guard. No one is allowed to see her, the guard said, almost amused by the request. I'm on strict orders from the royal family. The woman lowered her hood and revealed her face. Her skin was as pale as snow. Her hair was as dark as coal, and her eyes were as green as a forest. Her beauty was known throughout the land and her story known even beyond that. Your majesty, please forgive me, the stunned guard apologized. He quickly bent into an overly pronounced bow. I wasn't expecting anyone from the palace. No apology necessary, she said, but please do not speak of my presence here tonight. Of course, the guard said, nodding. The woman's face, the bars, waiting for them to be raised, but the guard hesitated. Are you sure you want to go in there, your highness? The guard said, there's no telling what she's capable of. I must see her, the woman said, at any cost. The guard began turning a large circular lever and the bars of the ceiling rose. The woman took a deep breath and continued past them. She journeyed through a longer, darker hallway where a series of bars and barriers were raised and then lowered after she walked past them. Finally, she reached the end of the hall and the last set of bars was raised as she stepped into the cell. The prisoner was a woman. She sat on a stool in the center of the cell and stared up at a small window. The prisoner waited a few moments before acknowledging the visitor behind her. It was the first visitor that she had ever had, and she knew who it was without looking. There was only one person it could be. Hello, Snow White, the prisoner said softly. Hello, stepmother, Snow White replied with a nervous quiver. I hope you're well. Although Snow White had rehearsed exactly what she wanted to say, she was now finding it nearly impossible to speak. I heard that you're queen now, her stepmother said. It's true, said Snow White. I've inherited the throne as my father intended. So, to what do I owe this honor? Have you come to watch me wither away, her stepmother said. There was such authority and power to her voice. It was known to make the strongest of men melt like ice. On the contrary, Snow White said, I've come to understand. To understand what? Her stepmother asked harshly. Why, Snow White hesitated, why you did what you did. And with this finally said,
Snow White felt a weight lift off her shoulders. She had finally asked the question that had been so strongly on her mind. Half of the challenge was over. There are many things about this world that you don't understand, the stepmother said. She turned to look at her stepdaughter. It was the first time in a long time that Snow White had seen her stepmother's face. It was the face of a woman who had once possessed beauty without flaw and the face of a woman who had once been queen. Now the woman sitting before her was just a prisoner whose looks had faded into a permanent sorrowful scowl. That may be, Snow White said, but can you blame me for trying to find some sort of reason behind your actions? The recent years of Snow White's life had become the most scandalous of the kingdom's royal history. Everyone knew the story of the fair princess who'd taken refuge with the seven dwarfs while hiding from her jealous stepmother. Everyone knew of the infamous poison apple and the dashing prince who saved Snow White from a false death. The story was simple, but the aftermath was not. Even with a new marriage and a monarchy to occupy her time, Snow White found herself constantly wondering if the theories of her stepmother's vanity were true. Something inside the new queen refused to believe that someone could be so malicious. Do you know what they're calling you out there? Snow White asked. Outside these prison walls, the world refers to you as the evil queen. If that's what the world has labeled me, then that's the name that I shall learn to live with the evil queen said. Once the world has made a decision, there's little anyone can do to change its mind. Snow White was astonished by how little her stepmother cared, but Snow White needed her to care. She needed to know that there was some humanity left in her. They want to execute you after they discovered your crimes against me. The whole kingdom wanted you dead. Snow White's voice faded into a faint whisper as she fought off the emotions building up inside her. But I wouldn't allow it. I couldn't. Am I supposed to thank you for sparing me? The evil queen asked. If you expect someone to fall at your feet and express gratitude, you've come to the wrong cell. I didn't do it for you. I did it for myself, Snow White said. Like it or not, you're the only mother that I have ever known. I refuse to believe that you are the soulless monster the rest of the world claims you to be. Whether it's true or not, I believe there is a heart deep down inside of you. Tears rolled down Snow White's pale face. She had promised herself she would stay strong, but she had lost control of her emotions once she was inside her stepmother's presence. Then I'm afraid you're wrong, the evil queen said. The only soul I've ever had died a long time ago. And the only heart you'll ever find in my possession is a heart of stone. The evil queen did indeed have a heart of stone, but not inside her. A rock in the shape and size of a human heart was on a small table in the corner of the cell. It was the only item the evil queen had been permitted to keep when she was arrested. Snow White recognized the stone from her childhood. It had always been very precious to her stepmother, and the evil queen had never let it out of her sight. Snow White had never been allowed to touch it or hold it, but nothing was stopping her now. She walked across the cell, picked it up, and curiously stared down at it, it brought back so many memories, all the neglect, the sadness that her stepmother had caused her as she was a child rushed through her. All my life, I only wanted one thing, Snow White said, your love. When I was a girl, I used to spend hours hiding in the palace, just hoping you would notice I was missing, but you never did. You spent your days in your chamber with your mirrors and your skin creams and this stone. You spent more time with strangers, with anti-aging methods than you did with your own daughter, but why? The evil queen did not answer. You tried to kill me four times, three of which you attempted yourself, 
Snow White said, shaking her head in disbelief. When you dressed as an old woman and came to me at the dwarf's cottage, I knew it was you. I knew you were dangerous, but I kept letting you in. I kept hoping you would change. I let you harm me. Snow White had never confessed this to anyone, and she couldn't help but bury her face in the palms of her hands, crying after saying it. You think you know heartbreak? The evil queen said so sharply that it startled her stepdaughter. You know nothing of pain. You never received affection from me, but from the moment you were born, you were loved by the whole kingdom. Others, however, are not so fortunate. Others, Snow White, sometimes only have the love they've ever known taken from them. Snow White didn't know what to say. What love was she referring to? Are you speaking of my father? Snow White asked. The evil queen closed her eyes and shook her head. Naivete is such a privileged trait, she said. Believe it or not, Snow White, I had my own life before I came into yours. Snow White grew quiet and slightly ashamed. Of course, she knew her stepmother had a life prior to marrying her father, but she had never considered what it had consisted of. Her stepmother had always been such a private person. Snow White never had reason to. Where is my mirror? The evil queen demanded. It's to be destroyed, Snow White told her. Suddenly, the evil queen's stone became much heavier in Snow White's hand. Snow White didn't know if this was really happening or if she was just imagining it. Her arm became tired from holding the stone hard and she had to put it aside. There's so much you're not telling me, Snow White said. There are so many things you've kept from me all these years. The evil queen lowered her head and stared at the ground. She remained silent. I may be the only person in the world with any compassion for you. Excuse me, I did that wrong. I may be the only person in the world with any compassion for you. Please tell me it isn't going to waste. Snow White pleaded. If there were events in your past that influenced your recent decisions, please explain to me. Still, there was no response. I'm not leaving here until you tell me, Snow White yelled, raising her voice for the first time in her life. Fine, the evil queen said. Snow White took a seat on another stool in the cell. The evil queen waited a moment before beginning and Snow White's anticipation grew. Your story will be forever romanticized, she told Snow White. No one will ever think twice about mine. I will continue to be degraded into nothing but a grotesque villain until the end of time. But what the world fails to realize is that a villain is just a victim whose story hasn't been told. Everything I've done, my life's work and my crimes against you has all been for him. Snow White felt her heart grow heavy. Her head was spinning and curiosity had taken over her entire body. Who? She asked so quickly that she forgot to hold back the desperation in her voice. The evil queen closed her eyes and let her memories surface. Images of places and people from her past flew out from the back of her mind like fireflies in a cave. There was so much she had seen in her younger years, so many things she wished to remember, and so many things she wished to forget. I will tell you about my past, or at least the past of someone I once was, the evil queen said. But consider yourself warned. My story is not one that ends with a happily ever after. Woof! That was the prologue. How many books do you think you've read in 2023? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to count them. I would have to count them. It's a good question, though. Maybe like five or six. That's not true, Rebecca. You've read at least four. That was a great prologue. Really fantastic prologue. Really great start. Really great start to a great book, I think. Good morning, I'm good, how are you? 
I mean, that, like, that's a prologue, friends. That was, that was, that was well done. Well done, Chris. Well done. That was good. That was good. All right, let's see how long this next chapter is. Oh, these chapters are long. All right. You haven't been here for a while. No worries. No worries. Lots of people pop in and out. No, that was just a prologue. That was not a chapter. That was just the prologue. It's okay, Haley. It will be on the video app later. Chapter one. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, Mrs. Peters said to her sixth grade class, these are the most magical words our world has ever known and the gateway into the greatest stories ever told. They're an immediate calling to anyone who hears them, a calling into a world where everyone is welcomed and anything can happen. Mice can become men, maids can become princesses, and they teach valuable lessons in the process. Alex Bailey eagerly sat up straight in her seat. She usually enjoyed her teacher's lessons, but this was something special and close to her heart. Fairy tales are so much more than silly bedtime stories, the teacher continued. The solution to almost every problem imaginable can be, can be found in the outcome of a fairy tale. Fairy tales are life lessons disguised with colorful characters and situations. The boy who cried wolf teaches us the value of a good reputation and the power of honesty. Cinderella shows us the reward of having a good heart. The ugly duckling teaches us the meaning of inner beauty. Alex's eyes were wide. She nodded in agreement. She was a pretty girl with bright blue eyes and short strawberry blonde hair that was always kept neatly out of her face with a headband. The way the other students stared at their teacher as if the lesson being taught were in another language was something Mrs. Peters had never grown accustomed to. So Mrs. Peters would often direct her entire lesson to the front row where Alex sat. Mrs. Peters was a tall, thin woman who always wore dresses that resembled old patterned sofas. Her hair was dark and curly and sat perfectly atop her head like a hat. All of her students often thought it was. Though a pair of thick glasses, through a pair of thick glasses, her eyes were permanently squinted from all the judgmental looks she had given her class over the years. Sadly, these timeless tales are no longer relevant in our society, Mrs. Peters said. We've traded their brilliant teachings for small-minded entertainment like television and video games. Parents now let obnoxious cartoons and violent movies influence their children. The only exposure to the tales some children acquire are versions bastardized by film companies. Fairy tale adaptations are usually stripped of every moral and lesson the stories were originally intended to teach and replaced by singing and dancing forest animals. I recently read that films are being created depicting Cinderella as a struggling hip hop singer and Sleeping Beauty as a warrior princess battling zombies. Amazing, a student behind Alex whispered to himself. Alex shook her head. Hearing this made her soul hurt. She tried to share her disapproval with her fellow classmates, but sadly her concern was not reciprocated. I wonder if the world would be a different place if everyone knew these tales the way the brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen had intended them to be known, Mrs. Peters said. I wonder if people would learn from the Little Mermaid's heartbreak when she dies at the end of her real story. I wonder if there would be so many kidnappings if children were shown the true dangers that Little Red Riding had faced. I wonder if delinquents would be so inclined to misbehave that they knew about the consequences that Goldilocks caused for herself with the three bears. There's so much to learn and to prevent for our futures if we just open our eyes to past teachings. Perhaps if we embraced fairy tales as much as we could, it would be much easier to find our own happily ever afters. If Alex had her way, Mrs. Peters would be rewarded with thunderous applause after each lesson she gave. Unfortunately, all that followed her classes was a mutual sigh of relief among the students, thankful that they were over. Let's see how well you all know your fairy tales, the teacher said with a smile and began pacing the room. In Rumpelstiltskin, what did the young maiden's father tell the king that his daughter could spin into hay? Excuse me, spin hay into. Does anyone know? Mrs. Peters scanned the classroom like a shark looking for a wounded fish. One student raised her hand. Yes, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Peters called. He claimed that she could spin hay into gold, Alex said. Very good, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Peters said. If she had a favorite student, not that she would ever admit to having one. 
it would have been Alex. Alex was always eager to please. She was the definition of a bookworm. It didn't matter what time of day it was, before school, during school, after school, before bed, she was always reading. She had a thirst for knowledge, and because of it, Alex was usually the first person to answer Mrs. Peter's questions. She tried her best to impress her classmates with every chance she got, putting extra effort into each book report, each class presentation that she was assigned, however, this usually annoyed the other students, and Alex was often teased for it. She constantly heard other girls making fun of her behind her back. She usually spent lunch alone under a tree somewhere with an open library book. Although she would never tell anyone, Alex was so lonely that it sometimes hurt. Now can anyone tell me what the compromise was that the maiden made with Rumpelstiltskin? Alex waited a moment before putting her hand up she didn't want to seem like a total teacher's pet. Yes, Miss Bailey? In exchange for turning hay into gold, the maiden promised to give Rumpelstiltskin her firstborn child when she became queen, Alex explained. That's a pretty steep deal, a boy said behind Alex. What a creepy old short man want with a baby, the girl asked next to him. Obviously, he couldn't adopt with a name like Rumpelstiltskin. Another student added, did he eat the baby? Someone else asked nervously. Alex turned around to face her clueless peers. You're all missing the point of the story, Alex said. Rumpelstiltskin took advantage of the maiden because she was in need. The story is about the price of a bad negotiation. What we're willing to give up in the long term for some short term in the present. Get it? If Miss Peters could change her facial expression, she would have looked very proud. Nicely put, Miss Bailey, she said. I must say, in all my years of teaching, I've rarely come across a pupil with as much in-depth knowledge as a loud snore came from the back of the classroom. A boy in the back row was slouched over his desk, drooling from the corner of his mouth, very much asleep. Alex had a twin brother, and it was moments like these that made her wish she didn't. Mrs. Peters diverted her attention to him like a paperclip to a magnet. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters asked. He continued to store. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters asked again, kneeling down closer to him. He let out another enormous snore. A few of the students wondered how it was possible for such a loud noise to come out of him. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters shouted into his ear. As if someone had lit a firework under his seat, Connor Bailey jumped back to life, almost knocking his desk chair over. Where am I? What happened? Connor asked in a panicked state of confusion. His eyes darted around the room while his brain tried to remember where he was. Like his sister, he also had bright blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair. His face was round and freckled. At the moment, slightly smushed to one side like a basset hound when it first wakes up from a nap. Alex couldn't have been more embarrassed by her brother. Besides sharing looks and a birthday, she and her brother could not have been more different. Connor may have had a lot of friends, but unlike his sister, he had trouble in school and mostly had trouble staying awake. I'm so glad you could rejoin us, Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters said sternly. Did you have a nice nap? Connor turned bright red. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Peters, he apologized, trying to be as genuine as possible. Sometimes when you talk for long periods of time, I doze off. No offense, I just can't help it. You fall asleep in my class at least twice a week, Mrs. Peters reminded him. Well, you do talk a lot. Before he could stop himself from saying it, Connor knew it was the wrong thing to say. A few of the students had to bite their hands to stop themselves from laughing. Well, I recommend you stay awake while I teach, Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters threatened. Connor had never seen anyone squint their eyes so tight without shutting them before. Unless you know enough about fairy tales to teach this lesson yourself, she added. I probably do, Connor said. Once again, he spoke without thinking. I mean, I know a lot about this stuff, that's all. Oh, really? Mrs. Peters never backed down from a challenge, and every student's worst nightmare was that they would be her challenger. All right, Mr. Bailey, if you're so knowledgeable, answer this question. Connor gulped. In the original tale of Sleeping Beauty, how many years does the princess sleep before she's awoken by true love's first kiss? Mrs. Peters asked, studying his face. 
All eyes were on him, impatiently waiting for the slightest indication that he didn't know the answer. But fortunately for Connor, he did. 100, Connor answered. Sleeping Beauty slept for 100 years. That's why the castle grounds was covered in vines and stuff, because the curse affected everyone in the kingdom and there was no one to garden. Mrs. Peters didn't know what to say or do. She frowned down at him, immensely surprised. This was the first time he had ever been correct when she put him on the spot, and she certainly hadn't expected it. Try to stay conscious, Mr. Bailey. Lucky for you, I used my last attention slip this morning, but I can always request more, Mrs. Peters said and promptly walked to the front of the classroom to continue her lesson. Connor sighed with relief. The red drained from his face. His eyes met his sister's. Even she was surprised that he'd gotten the answer right. Alex hadn't expected Connor to remember any fairy tales. Now, class, I want you to get out your literature books and turn to page 170 and read Little Red Riding Hood quietly to yourselves, Mrs. Peters instructed. The students did as they were told, and Connor made himself comfortable as possible as his desk, at his desk and began reading. The story, the pictures, and the characters were all so familiar to him. One of the things that Alex and Connor looked forward to most when they were very young had been trips to see their grandmother. She lived up in the mountains in the heart of the woods in a tiny house that could be best described as a cottage, if such a thing still existed. It was a long journey, a few hours by car, but the twins loved every minute of it. Their anticipation would grow as they traveled up the windy roads through the endless trees. And when they crossed a yellow bridge, the twins would excitedly exclaim, we're almost there, we're almost there. Once they arrived, their grandmother would greet them at the door with open arms and hugs so tight they would almost pop. Look at you two. You've both grown a foot since the last time I saw you. Grandma would say, even if they hadn't. And then they, she would lead them inside where a freshly baked batch of cookies waited for them. Their father had grown up in the woods and would spend hours each day telling the twins his adventures as a kid, all the trees he'd climbed, all the streams he'd swum, and all the ferocious animals he'd barely escaped from. Most of his retellings were highly exaggerated, but they loved this time with him more than anything else in the world. Some day when you're older, I'll take you to all the secret places where I used to play, their father would tease them. He was a tall man with kind eyes that would wrinkle whenever he smiled, and he smiled quite a bit, especially when he's teasing the twins. At night, the twins' mother would help their grandmother cook dinner, and after they'd eaten as soon as the dishes were done, the family would sit around the fireplace. Their grandmother would open her big storybook and she and their father would take turns reading the twins' fairy tales until they fell asleep. Sometimes the Bailey family would be up until sunrise. They told stories with such detail and passion that it didn't matter how many times the twins heard the same tale. They were the best memories any child could ask for. Unfortunately, the twins hadn't been back to their grandmother's cottage in a very long time. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters shouted. Connor had dozed off again. Sorry, Mrs. Peters, he bellowed back, sitting straight up in his seat like a soldier on guard. If looks could kill, Connor would have been dead from the scowl she was sending him. What did we think of the real Little Red Riding Hood? The teacher asked her class. A girl with frizzy hair and thick braces raised her hand. Mrs. Peters, the frizzy haired girl asked, I'm confused. And why is that? Mrs. Peters asked as if asking what on earth could possibly be confusing you, you idiot. Because it says the big bad wolf is killed by the hunter. The frizzy haired girl explained, I always thought the wolf was just upset because the other wolves in his pack made fun of his snout and he and Little Red Riding Hood became friends at the end. At least that's what happened in the cartoon I used to watch when I was little. Mrs. Peters rolled her eyes so far back in her head that she could see what was behind her. That, she said with a clenched jaw, is exactly why we're having this lesson. The frizzy haired girl's eyes became wide and sad. How could something so dear to her have been so wrong? For homework, Mrs. Peters said, and the room unanimously slumped in their seat, you are to pick your favorite fairy tale and write a paper due tomorrow on the real lesson that the fairy tale is trying to teach us. Mrs. Peters went to her desk 
and the students began working on their assignments with the little remaining class time. Mr. Bailey, Mrs. Peters summoned Connor to her desk. A word. Connor was deep in trouble and he knew it. He cautiously stood up and walked to Mrs. Peters' desk and the other students gave him a sorrowful look as he walked by, as if he were walking to an executioner. Yes, Mrs. Peters, Connor asked. Connor, I'm trying to be very sensitive about your family situation, Mrs. Peters said, glaring at him over the frame of her glasses. Family situation. Two words Connor had heard too many times in the last year. However, Mrs. Peters continued, there's a certain behavior that I will not tolerate in my classroom. You're constantly falling asleep in class. You don't pay attention, and not to mention, you quiz and test very poorly. Your sister seems to be functioning just fine. Perhaps you could follow her example? It was a comparison that felt like a kick in the stomach every time someone made it. Indeed, Connor was not his sister by any means, and he was always punished because of it. If this continues, I will be forced to have a meeting with your mother. Do you understand? Mrs. Peters warned him. Yes, sir. I mean, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. It's just, I had, this hasn't been, it hadn't been his best day. Okay, then. You may have a seat. Connor slowly walked back to his seat, his head hanging, slightly lower than it had all day. More than anything, he hated feeling like a failure. Alex watched the entire conversation between her brother and her teacher. As much, much as her brother embarrassed her, she did feel bad for him as only a sister could. Alex flipped through her literature book, deciding on which story to write about. The pictures weren't as colorful and as exciting as they had been in her grandmother's book, but seeing all the characters that she had grown up reading made her feel at home, a feeling that had recently become a rarity. If only fairy tales were real, she thought. Somebody could wave a wand and magically make things how they used to be. What do we think happened? Does anyone know what time it is? What do we think happened in the last year that made everything so sad? This is great. I love this so far. I'm like, I'm obsessed at 746. Some comments in this live are filtered to protect the community's experience. It's so early in the morning for that. Whoever's out there saying things that need to be filtered, y'all need to get your life together. It's too early in the morning for this. And I know, but I won't tell. Yeah, don't tell. I'm obsessed with this so far. I'm really glad that we picked this up. It was a total accident. I'm not team either of the kids. I'm team the kids come together and save the day. I, I love this. I love this so far. I'm really, really, really into it. Um, I want to see how long chapter two is and see if we have time to read chapter two. No, I don't think so. It's kind of long. I don't think we're going to have time to read chapter two. Um, so we'll read chapter two tomorrow, but this is, this is pretty, pretty freaking awesome. Um, Shelly deleted a keyword. What's a keyword? Yeah, the book is really great. And the really cool thing about this, like um, there are three freaking phone calls and I had to call one back, ridiculous. Why do people call you so much? Aren't you a millennial? Don't people know that you don't take phone calls? I don't understand. Um, this book is so good and because it's kid friendly, part of me, um, the new book is The Land of Stories, The Wishing Spell by Chris Coffer. Part of me feels like I might do some of this for the read alouds here on the page. I know I was gonna do The Hunger Games, but like this is really kind of ripe for it because it's so kid friendly. So I might just take pieces of the, um, of the live and post them for read alouds for everybody. I don't know. Um, seriously though, I'm a millennial and no phone calls, please and thank you. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I totally am with you. Um, so anyway, I'm go I never read Chris Crowley. Yeah, yeah. I knew he was an author and I had meant to read them, but like I'm not a Glee person. So I never, you know, a lot of people went to read his stuff just because he's on Glee, but like I don't care about Glee. So I was never like, oh, I have to read it. But this book is exactly the type of, I mean, like if this had been out when I, I mean, I'm loving it now, but if this had been out when I was a kid, forget it forget it. I would have been clutching this with every like 
inch of my face. I would have like, you never would have ripped this out of my hands if this had come out when I was a kid. Oh my God, forget it. Um, it's funny because this is the exact type of book. Well, no, I guess not exact. This is in the same genre, but slightly younger. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet. But like I went to grad school to write updated fairy tales. Like that was the whole point of my graduate studies. So like this speaks to me in a way that stuff doesn't always, you know what I mean? Um, so this is very, very exciting. Oh, look, there's a map at the front. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. I'm one of those people who hates reading, but I love listening to books. Yeah, there's a lot of people like that. You're not alone by any means. There's a lot of people, um, I think Becca is one of them who's in here. She only likes listening to books, but you know what? It counts as reading. There have been many, many studies by a lot of scientists and, and they have come to the conclusion that listening to books on tape is just as good for your brain as reading them. So it's the same. Don't let anyone shame you for listening to books over reading them. That's not a thing you will ever find here. I listen to audiobooks while I work all day long. I'm currently listening to one that's a little spicier than I thought it was going to be when I picked it up. Woo, it's spicy. But just don't listen to it in front of Zoe. Um, but I listen to audiobooks all day. I read to Oliver while he plays. Yeah, that's the... Okay, so you guys know the Tony box, the little thing that that video of Zoe went viral for putting the Peppa Pig thing on. Have you guys seen that video where she puts the little Peppa Pig thing on the thing and knocks off Elsa or Ariel or whoever she knocked off that little box? Um, that, that little box that she has is basically a box of books for kids that it reads to the kids. Yeah. So the Tony box is a little box that you, the kids can choose what character to put on top and it will read them stories from that character. I didn't know there were two other Peppa Tonys. Maybe I'll get them for her birthday. Um, I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, Shelly. I'll, I'll look it up and I'll tell you. Um, yeah, I don't like reading, but I love listening to people read. Yeah, I totally get that. I listen to books on tape all the time. Just because I read doesn't mean I don't listen. Yeah, I love the Tony box. I think it's so great. Sometimes Zoe will just be playing by herself and she will listen to to the audio books from those things while she plays. You know what I mean? It's so good for your brain. It's so good for your brain. Um, yeah. So you will never hear any shaming from me over books on tape versus physical paper books. Um, I, don't, I don't really see a difference, honestly. I need to read more to the littles. I used to read to Max so much. Yeah, yeah, that, that's different, Becca. You definitely should read to the littles. Um, that's different than like you picking up like an adult book for yourself. Maybe you can read them Zoe's book. Should I send you a copy of Zoe's book so that you can read them looking for Tango? Mm. Wouldn't that be cute? You should read them looking for Tango. Zoe reads that book every night right now because we're getting her ready for the new baby, you know? Um, I'm trying to find a way to print it more cheaply. Yeah, I need to I need to get away to print. Zoe's book was really expensive for me to print, which is the only reason that I haven't um um it'll be up today, Tiffany. It was it was a long um live, so it took a while um for uh it to like render. Brandon asked me yesterday when he's getting a new baby. Oops. Oops. Where can I get the books? Where can you get what what books, uh sweetheart? What books? Any books, the library, the bookstore, Audible, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I don't know. Yeah, I'll put it up right after this, Tiffany. It just, it, because it was so long, it took a, a long time. Um, Max still asked for another baby. He got three. Is that not enough? He has three siblings. That's plenty, friend. You need to slow your roll. He does not need any more siblings. Tell Max he does not need any more siblings. Zoe has never asked for a sibling, but she's getting one anyway, whether she wants it or not. He's coming in one month. Yesterday, Catherine and I were sitting 
and we were saying, it's enough slices. It's definitely enough slices. Catherine and I were looking at the calendar yesterday and we were like, wouldn't it be great if you went into labor in exactly one month from this moment? <laughs> we can't afford any more siblings, especially the fertility part. Yeah, no more siblings, no more siblings. You don't need any more children, Becca. You have four. Four is plenty. Four is plenty. Um, all right, I'm gonna go. I will put up the... Um, the last gauntlet live and I will see you all later. We've got a lot to do tonight. So I'll see you on the flip side. Bye.